So I think that's most people have joined and um, there will be some others I'm sure as the afternoon goes on. My name is Liz Darlison. I'm the Chief Executive of Mesothelioma UK and I'm delighted to welcome you to the fifth Mesothelioma Matters webinar. Um, you will recall that we've uh, planned a whole year of monthly webinars covering um, hot topics um, to suit the breadth of the mesothelioma community. So some are probably more geared towards uh, patients and some are probably more geared towards um, clinical um, scientists. So very, very varied. If any of you do join the, the webinar and you're, you, you, are, you have questions or concerns or it prompts um, issues that you don't want to raise as a question in the webinar, please, please do contact Meso UK on our free phone telephone number 0800 169 2409 and one of the nurses will be glad to have a little chat with you. So just the housekeeping things again, please keep muted and cameras off. Um, there is a chat facility. So um, at the bottom of your screen in the middle, there's a little bubble that's got chat underneath. If you want to ask a question, please just type it in there and we will. Anything. We have, you've been fiddling. Liz, you muted yourself back. I think Julie might have muted me by mistake there. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm back with you. It automatically muted somehow. <laughs> um, so, sorry, I was just saying there's a few things I wanted to just point out. The first one is that um, next week sees the start of the International Mesothelioma Interest Group Conference. This is an event that's held internationally every two years. It was scheduled for March last year in Australia and sadly due to the COVID pandemic had to be postponed. Um, so it is the 2020 conference that's now become the IMIG 2021 virtual conference. It kicks off officially a week on Friday, three days of uh, conferences all online. And um, I'm glad to say that there is also a, a three pre-event workshops, one of which is a nursing workshop that are happening this weekend. So keep your eye on social media. I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, activity on social media relaying some of the golden nuggets that we hear at that conference. Um, our next Meso Matters uh, webinar is on Monday the 24th of May at four o'clock in the afternoon. And it's with um, uh, a professor from France called Didier Jean. And the session is about uh, mesothelioma tumor heterogeneity. He's a world leading expert on that. And um, so we hope that some of you will join us for that. Before I introduce our afternoon speakers, if you'd like to support the charity, can I urge you please to look at our fundraising pages. Um, we've got a number of really um, mouthwatering challenges uh, up on there. Um, we also have our lottery that we'd welcome you to join in. We've got a very unusual um, fundraising event happening on the 13th of May, although registration for it closes on Wednesday and many of you will know well, Professor Peake, who has been the chair of our board since the charity started. Um, he's a real wine expert. And so he is hosting a virtual wine tasting evening. Um, but because of the wine order that has to be put in, that closes at 12 o'clock this Wednesday. And there's only a couple of places left, I think, on that event. But we're really happy to welcome you to that. Um, we've also launched last month our Carers Hour and um, we weren't sure how frequently that was going to run, have now decided that would be monthly. So um, we have a monthly carers hour that's hosted by Head of Nursing Lorraine Creech and the, the, the team leaders. And I think the format is they have a speaker talking about something relevant to carers. Um, we please only want carers to register for that event. And the next one's on the 12th of May. And you can find out more about that through our social media or our website. Oh, and I also have to say, we're about to go into May, and May is always muffins for Miso. If you'd like a baking, a muffins baking kit, and want to support us with muffins for Miso, then again, contact um, the Miso UK information line or drop us an email, and we'd be glad to support you with that. So without further ado, um, again, really warm welcome. 
and I want to say a big hello to our two speakers this afternoon. We are so lucky in the UK that we have got world leading experts in peritoneal mesothelioma and we have a national center for peritoneal mesothelioma and we have consultant colorectal surgeon Fahiz Mohammed and uh, Mesothelioma UK's very own national clinical nurse specialist in peritoneal mesothelioma Sam Westbrook who are going to talk to us today um, about peritoneal chemotherapy, uh, hypothermic peritoneal, oh gosh, got my, need to put my teeth in, sorry, about surgery and hypothermic peritoneal chemotherapy for peritoneal mesothelioma. So welcome both of you and um, thank you so much for uh, giving up some of your time uh, to talk uh, at the Meso Matters webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Liz, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all about what we do here. So I'm here with, with Sam. Sam, we're going to do a double act this afternoon. So I'll, I'll kick off and then Sam's going to follow on uh, from me and then we'll take some questions at the end. So um, I'm, my name's Fahiz Mohammed. I'm a, a consultant surgeon. Uh, I work in Basingstoke at the Peritoneal Malignancy Institute. Um, and really, I'm going to talk to you about peritoneal mesothelioma and how we, how we approach and treat it uh, in Basingstoke. Um, that's just fine. So peritoneal mesothelioma it's, is rare, but of all the people who have mesothelioma, about up to a third can have involvement of the peritoneum. Nobody's quite sure how many cases uh, there are every year, but some people say one in five million. Um, so it is, it is very rare, um, but it's the most common cancer of the, what we call primary cancer of the peritoneum. So basically a cancer that arises from the lining of the abdomen. And there's always been a question around how closely it's linked to pleural mesothelioma, which many of you will be familiar with and which is more, more common. Um, and also the link between asbestos exposure and the development of peritoneal mesothelioma. So um, some people think it's the same disease, just in a different cavity. Other th others think that there's a slight difference um, <clears throat> between, the, between the tumor types. What we do know is that without any treatment, um, most people don't, don't live for very long. Um, and that the, the, the mainstay or the backbone of systemic chemotherapy uh, at present is cisplatinum and pemetrexed, which is uh, really the main chemotherapy uh, doublet that's been used for pleural mesothelioma for a number of years now. And it's just been extrapolated for use into peritoneal mesothelioma. But the response rate isn't great. Um, some people respond to it very well, but many don't respond to it at all. Most people run into difficulty with mesothelioma because um, in the peritoneum because of progressive disease, which then starts to produce ascites and fluid in the abdomen, um, which then compresses the organs and stops people from being able to eat and drink. I'm going to touch on um, the different types of uh, peritoneal mesothelioma uh, later on, but there is a people make this distinction with with what's called what's so called malignant. Uh, peritoneal mesothelioma, and then um, what you, you might call borderline malignant or um, uh, cystic, uh, multi-cystic mesothelioma, which behaves very differently um, and, and has a much better outcome. So what we've found ourselves and other centers across the world is that if people do respond to systemic chemotherapy, then there may be a role for what we call cytoreductive surgery and hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So that's a combination of stripping all of the surfaces that have disease with the tumor on them and resecting any organs combined with a, a hot chemotherapy wash, which we give for an hour at the time of the surgery to try and reduce the risk of the tumor coming back again. We also use early post-operative intraperitoneal chemotherapy, which is chemotherapy given at room temperature for the first four or five days after the operation, again, to prevent tumor growing back again. And other, we don't, although we don't use it in the UK, other centers around the world have used long-term 
what's called bidirectional chemotherapy, which is intraperitoneal and intravenous chemotherapy. Um, and more recently, people have been using pressurized intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy, which is also known as PIPAC. And I'll talk about a bit about that uh, later on. So how do people present? Usually it's with um, an increase in their abdominal girth. So their waist trousers get tighter or the skirts don't fit as well. For men, they, most people think it's because they've got a beer belly and they're just getting older, but that's the most common cause. And that's usually because of fluid ascites uh, accumulation. Um, and many people uh, present with abdominal pain, some with weight loss uh, and, and, and less commonly a new hernia uh, or a change in bowel habit. And some people with tumor actually growing out of the abdominal wall, that's less common, uh, but it can happen sometimes at the belly button um, where tumor, uh, tumor is growing through. If we were to classify um, peritoneal mesothelioma, most of what we see is what's called epithelial. So this is what it looks like under the microscope. Um, sarcomatous is, is the, the next most common. And then there are a group of patients who have what's called biphasic, which is a mixture of epithelial and sarcomatoid mesothelioma. Um, in a separate category really is, is what we call multicystic mesothelioma and also well differentiated papillary mesothelioma. Now, I think the, the reason I'm highlighting this is this, this, is, not, uh, this is not one single entity when we talk about uh, peritoneal mesothelioma and it's, it is important to get an experienced pathologist to have a look at these, uh, any, any, um, any cells under the microscope because it does have an impact on what treatment we might offer, but also how people might do in the long term. And these two borderline or what we call low malignant potential meso peritoneal mesothelioma as well differentiated and multicystic, they, they do, these, these patients do very well long term uh, if, if they have the type of surgery that we're talking about. So as um, this touched on, we are one of the two centers that treats um, we're commissioned to treat pseudomyxoma peritonei, which is another rare cancer that arises from the appendix. The um, treatment that we use for mesothelioma is, is similar. Um, there are five centers in the UK and Ireland treating colorectal cancer that spread to the peritoneum, uh, but there's only one center that actually uh, treats uh, peritoneal mesothelioma. And part of that is around the funding in that these other conditions from the appendix and from colorectal cancer come with funding attached to them from NHS England. But for, for mesothelioma, that funding doesn't exist at this moment in time. And that's primarily because NHS England doesn't feel that there's enough high quality evidence to support um, a fully blown funded service. Having said that, we were treating this, we've been treating this for 20, 25 years now. And so our trust has decided that we'll continue to treat it um, and although we don't get the full um, funding that we get if we were treating these other rare cancers, uh, we're still able to continue um, uh, managing patients with this condition. Just talk a bit about the different types. So we talked about epithelioid mesothelioma. You, this is, uh, these are some CT scans and some PET scans where it, where it lights up um, red or green, that's where you've got increased uptake of the glucose that patients have to drink, the radioactive glucose, and that shows you where these where the tumours are. So they're lining the, the surface of the abdomen. Um, and it's the commonest type of mesothelioma. Uh, as I touched on before, this, pro this type probably has the strongest association with asbestos exposure. Um, and some of these, some of the patients that have epithelial mesothelioma present with a big a uh, big slab of tumour in their omentum, which is the curtain of fat underneath their stomach, uh, and a lot of ascites, so a big distended blown up belly, which is full of fluid, and that can be, give them terrible symptoms. And often um, that, that needs to be drained, that fluid needs to be drained on a regular basis. If patients respond to chemotherapy, that fluid dramatically dries up very quickly. Um, but this tumour tends to involve and encase the, um, um, the, the, the bowel, and you can see there in the middle, those of you who are squeamish might want to turn away because there'll be more pictures like this during the presentation. But that picture in the middle um, is, is, is what it looks like. Um, 
on the left hand side is, is the omentum. You've got tumor, which has basically solidified that. And there are loops of bowel there, which have got tumor on them. Um, and, and what stops us from removing all the disease tends to be involvement of the small bowel surfaces. And that's not always easy to establish until, until you're actually at operation. But increasingly we're using laparoscopy beforehand to be able to identify those patients that would be able to help. Um, less common is the biphasic or sarcomatoid mesothelioma. These tend to be um, more uh, rapidly progressing. The tumors grow very quickly. Um, and for most of these patients, uh, surgery isn't, isn't really an option. For, for a small proportion, those that respond very well to chemotherapy, then we have operated on them and they have done well. Um, but but um, we, we're more careful about selecting patients with this type of histology. Uh, well, I'll just touch on this. Well-differentiated papillary mesothelioma is, is almost in this um, a crossover between the more aggressive and the less aggressive uh, mesotheliomas. Some of these tumors grow very slowly um, and they do very well after surgery, the type of surgery that we do. Others act a little bit more like epithelioid mesothelioma um, and they can present in a variety of different ways. It's not easy to diagnose these types of tumors under the microscope, which is why we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Norman Carr, who's a very experienced pathologist in peritoneal malignancy. Um, and he will always review the histology slides from patients before we make a final diagnosis or judgment. Cystic mesothelioma is, you know, falls into this low malignancy or, or what some people call borderline malignancy. Um, you can see those cysts in the middle and that's very characteristic. The CT scan, everything's pushed to one side. Um, and these, these patients probably do the best with surgery in that they're, they're more likely to be cured. They can come back again, um, but if you combine surgery with, with the hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, um, we've operated on about 43, 44 patients over the last 20 years, um, and they've all, done, uh, they've all done very well. So what's the evidence behind what we do? And I'll just talk you through uh, some of the recent evidence that supports uh, this approach. So cytoreductive surgery, as I said, that's stripping the lining or the peritoneum of the abdomen um, and also removing disease. That's the liver on the bottom left hand side, which we've, we've burnt the surface of the liver, um, but we strip the disease away. Sometimes we need to remove organs like the spleen, uh, like the um, gallbladder, the uterus, the ovaries, parts of the bowel. Um, and we combine that once we've removed all the tumor with a hot chemotherapy wash, we use cisplatinum and doxorubicin heated to 42 degrees centigrade for one hour. Um, and then we use early post-operative chemotherapy in selected patients um, at room temperature with the same drugs. We know that the most, basically the, the best outcomes uh, come when we can remove all visible disease, which is why it's very important for us before we put people through this surgery that we're, we're confident that we can remove everything. Um, because if we can't, then people don't benefit as much. This is just, this is um, a paper of pooled results um, from 401 patients from around the world with um, malign what's called, what they call malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. So most of those patients had epithelioid mesothelioma. And if they had a complete tumor removal, had the hot chemotherapy wash, then five year survival is, is not bad, um, 47%. Traditionally, if you think that people wouldn't live longer than a year uh, with this disease, then uh, many of these patients will get systemic chemotherapy as well. But, but we're looking at, at um, being able to prolong survival in a good number of patients. When you look at those patients that benefit the most, it's probably the, the women, uh, those with an epithelial subtype, if you don't have lymph nodes, you're more likely to do better. The peritoneal cancer index is just an, an indication of how much disease there is. Um, the maximum is 39, the, the least is zero. Um, as you would imagine intuitively, the less disease you have, the more likely you are to live longer. Um, and the completeness of site eruption is whether we can remove all the disease or not. And again, if we can remove all the disease, you do better. Um, this is 
just looking at the extent of disease, um, and this is a survival curve, so it's just dividing the patients into the amount of disease that they had, the least disease at the top, then more disease, and then the most disease at the bottom. And you can see that the best survival is in that line at the top with those patients who have the least disease. So we're looking when we're selecting patients for surgery for patients who have limit, relatively limited disease and disease that we're confident we can remove. When, 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 we're, all, when we're looking to try and predict those people who are gonna benefit the most, there's lots of different ways of doing this. This is a nomogram, which is a, a clever bit of statistics, which basically plums in all the factors in a group of patients who we've got survival data on, um, and then tries to come up with a way that we can predict who's gonna do well and who might not do so well. So this, um, this chart here, basically that top group there. So if you've got epithelioid um, tumor with a solid component under 10%, you've got a limited disease and your tumor markers, which are, give us an idea of how the tumor might behave. If they're low, then you're gonna do the best uh, after this type of surgery. Whereas if you've got a sarcomatoid or biphasic tumor, then you don't do so well, which is why it's very important that we get all this information beforehand. So we're not putting people through treatments that are gonna cause them a lot of um, trouble uh, without that much benefit. This is, um, this is a very recent um, uh, paper from essentially all those surgeons around the world that treat peritoneal mesothelioma and they've come up with practice, clinical practice guidelines for diagnosis, treatment and follow-up. Um, and they've looked at um, the evidence that's out there, they've graded it and they've come up with some guidelines as to what, what we should be doing, how we should be managing these patients uh, in terms of the type of tumor, what treatments to offer and in what order. Um, a lot of what they based, based this on is the is what the tumours look like under the microscope, um, but also what things look like at laparoscopy. Um, and so this is, this is us beginning to develop or, or be, begin to standardise as surgeons around the world treating this rare cancer, the way that things should be treated based on what we know. But, but we still, there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, I'll just give you a brief outline of our own experience. So um, this is 60, uh, sorry, 76 patients out of nearly one and a half thousand that have had surgery for other types of tumor, mainly appendix tumors, uh, but also colorectal cancer. Out of that 76, 39 had these low grade mes peritoneal mesotheliomas, that's multicystic and well differentiated papillary. Um, and, and the 37 um, had uh, either epithelioid we have operated on some biphasic, you can see there, seven, uh, seven patients with biphasic tumors. Um, we, all of these patients have, uh, we see them in clinic, they have a CT scan. We're starting to use MRI to look at the small bowel. It's called diffusion weighted imaging MRI, which can give us a better idea of what the small bowel looks like. The CT is not that great at that. We check people's tumor markers, they're CA125, CEA, CA99, that can give us an indication of how the tumor might behave. And in selected patients, we laparoscope them. We did a couple of lapros laparoscopies today in patients with mesothelioma, just to clarify exactly what's going on and identify if they're suitable for surgery. This is our own survival. So you can see on the left-hand side, those patients with the multicystic and um, uh, the well-differentiated papillary mesothelioma, they do much better. Um, those patients with um, the epithelioid types, um, the survival isn't as good, but it's still better than, um, than systemic chemotherapy alone. The KI67 proliferation index. So this is a lot of people have been talking about this recently. Again, it's, a, it's something that pathologists tell us when they look at these tumor cells under the microscope. This, this index gives us an idea of how... how um, I guess you could say aggressive the tumor might be. Um, if it's well, in our own experience, we've, if it, there's a cutoff of 7% and more than 7%, some other people have said 12%, other people 20%. 
but in essence, it gives us an idea of how the tumor might behave. So less than 7%, we know that those patients are probably going to do better in the long term. If it's more than that, then we need to keep a close eye and they may need, um, they may have recurrent disease or they, their survival may not be so good in the long term. But it's not, not an absolute and we wouldn't use it as a decision making um, factor. It just helps us guide prognosis. Um, this is uh, our, our recent paper on multi-cystic peritoneal mesothelioma. So you can see that bottom left-hand side, that's what it looks like, these cysts. Uh, often it's found incidentally at laparoscopy or investigation for infertility in women. Um, and those are some scans, MRI scans, showing, showing what it looks like. So it are it is multiple cysts within the abdomen, um, which we need to peel away. Traditionally, people would just scoop these out and they would just keep coming back. Um, but we found that if we, we strip the peritoneum, give the hot chemotherapy wash, that actually we can, um, we can potentially cure people. And you're going to see Sam, and I always show, I love showing this picture because it, it, make, it makes her cringe. But it, it, this, so we're very grateful to Mesothelioma UK uh, and to Sam for taking on the, on the role, but she's the, the UK's first and probably the world's first dedicated um, peritoneal mesothelioma nurse specialist. And... Um, you know, it's great to have her on board and she's going to talk to you a bit in a second uh, about the peritoneal mesothelioma MDT. Um, sorry, go back there a sec. So pressure, I'll just touch on this, pressurised intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy. This is a new technology, relatively new, when I say well, probably the last decade. Um, it's a different way of giving chemotherapy into the abdomen. It's at room temperature, but it's, it's basically given, it's a common diesel rail injector which you'd get in your German you know, diesel car, which is basically linked to a pump that pushes chemotherapy under pressure into the peritoneal cavity. And it creates an aerosol with um, increased penetration of peritoneal surfaces. So this is for patients who are not suitable for surgery initially, um, who may benefit from this, uh, this type or this uh, method of administrating, uh, administrating chemotherapy. It's still experimental. Um, there's a trial going on in France, um, which is called Mesotip, um, and has started randomizing where they're basically taking patients with peritoneal mesothelioma um, and they're giving them a combination of the PIPAC, the pressurized intraperitoneal chemotherapy, with standard systemic chemotherapy and comparing that with the control arm, which is systemic chemotherapy alone. And they're looking for disease response. Um, uh, by CT scan and by MRI. And I think for some patients, particularly those with small bowel surface involvement, um, it can be very effective uh, when, when there aren't many other treatment options. It, it, doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily convert people into being suitable for the type of surgery that we talk about with the, the HIPEC, um, with the cytoreductive surgery, but it may actually prolong their survival and improve their quality of life better than systemic chemotherapy alone. And I'd like to thank, take this opportunity to thank Mesothelioma UK, HASAG and the Mavis Nye Foundation for helping us to fund purchase of our own PIPAC kit, which we're hoping to then use for a trial um, for patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, and what we'd like to do is, is really be um, as bold and as innovative uh, with that trial as possible. And perhaps with the new uh, immunotherapy agents that have shown such promise in pleural mesothelioma, try and introduce them into the treatment of peritoneal mesothelioma in addition to the surgery that we do and the established systemic chemotherapy. So um, just to wrap things up and I'll, I'll hand over to, to Sam, we know that the best outcomes from surgery come with, you know, with favorable histopathology, uh, low volume disease, and when we can remove all the disease that we can see, Women tend to do better than men. Um, and if you've got no lymph node involvement, then you're more likely to do uh, better long-term. On the horizon, immunotherapy showing a lot of promise. Um, molecular markers, we're beginning to understand more about them. Some of you may have heard about long-term intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So this is putting a port inside the abdomen and then having repeated administrations of intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Um, and Paul Sugarbaker and some other people have shown Good results with that. We don't do it in the UK at the moment, but I'm hopeful that um, if PIPAC, if we can establish PIPAC, which is our aim, 
then that will be um, an alternative and perhaps um, more effective way of administrating, administrating chemotherapy in the long term. So I'll hand over to, um, to Sam now. We just have to bear with us. I'm going to do a bit of screen sharing. Um, Hopefully you can see us. Okay, right. Hi, thanks for having me to speak today. Just want to move forward. So I just wanted to take you through some statistics. Uh, so just looking at um, the National Mesothelioma Audit that was published uh, in 2020, this was looking at a two-year period of uh, patients. And uh, as you can see there, the majority, as we know, nearly 7,000 cases are pleural mesothelioma. The peritoneal mesothelioma in those two years was, was about 260 patients. And, and you'll see there that the actual differences with male and female differ slightly. So there were, there were more females and, and, less, and less males. And the audit did show that 28% of these cases were reviewed at RMDT. And that is still a bit low. Our ambition is for, to be a lot more than that in, in the next audit. However, that has doubled from the previous audit, which was, which was 14%. So that, that's some real improvement for peritoneal patients. And the overall conclusion uh, for, from the audit was that there was improvement in the treatments and management of, of these patients. So the recommendation from the audit uh, was for peritoneal patients to all be discussed at a mesothelioma MDT and to be signposted to Meso UK resources and, and for those to be referred to our national MDT. I'm just going to touch on a little bit of what Fahee spoke about in terms of commissioning and funding of our of the service we do here in Basingstoke. So just to take you back a little bit to July 2015, um, NHS England, uh, there was no commissioning for, for the for the surgery that we do here. Um, but Basingstoke uh, continued the work that they've been offering for 20, 20 plus years. Um, and agreed to establish this National Peritoneal Mesothelioma MDT meeting, which I'll explain what that really means in more detail. Um, and, and through that, we're, we're collecting data, we're looking at patients, we're tracking patients on, on what treatments they're having, how, how they've responded to that, um, and essentially trying to provide some equity in treatments uh, across the UK for, for peritoneal. And then in 2019, Mesa UK funded my role um, to, to work here in Basingstoke with the team and to support patients in the UK with this disease. So our MDT runs monthly. Um, my aim would be in the future to have it a little bit more frequently. Um, we join on a video conference <laughs> and uh, with other surgical centres. Uh, around the UK, Basingstoke, we have uh, Dublin and Birmingham and the Christie and all the surgeons join on there with our oncologist and our specialist uh, pathologist Norman Carr, uh, radiologist myself and our coordinator. We review all these cases and we look at the histology, all the images you can see in the picture there, we have them up on the screen there. Uh, for us all to view in all the different centres as well. And we, we all talk about these cases and then we'd recommend a, a, a treatment plan. And then that would be communicated back to the uh, referring hospital. And if we offer any surgical intervention, then we would contact the patient to come and see us here. So I just thought this was quite interesting to have a, have a look at. Um, our patients present in a large variety of specialities. Um, so I had a look at uh, data 
over a 26 month period. And as you can see there, a, a big, well, a big majority, 28% presented to an OBS and gynae speciality, and then followed by colorectal, gastro, and general surgery. We published some data back in 2019, um, which showed the effectiveness of RMDT and how we were then able to select patients very carefully who then proceeded to have surgery. And the majority of the patients that were discussed were epithelioid, followed by multi-cystic and then biphasic. And then we've just updated that furthermore, that data, and we're discussing this at IMIG uh, next week. Um, so you can see there from, from some of the numbers that uh, the, the mean age of the patients was around 57 years uh, for, for patients who were referred to our MDT. Uh, we, look, we saw 26% of those in our outpatients and 14% proceeded to the CRS and HIPEC operation. The median follow-up time was 25 months and 28% um, of those had died during that time, uh, sadly. So what, what, do, I, what do I do? So um, when patients are referred to us for our MDT, I try and make contact with those patients and talk to them on the phone. I try and speak to their, their perhaps their nurse or their treating doctor, just to get a bit more information, um, discuss with them the disease, perhaps discuss any man symptoms that they're having and how we can manage that. Um, they will often ask what treatment options there are. So we talk in depth about that. And then when we are at the meeting, I would act as their, their advocate at that meeting and, and convey any wishes that, that, that they have. Um, and then, and then, uh, then speak to them afterwards. We produce some patient information resources. So if we, if you have a look on our website, there's a booklet there about peritoneal mesothelioma that's just been recently updated. So you can have a have a look at that one. And via the website, there's a there's a big chart. I just put it on the left hand side there of the clinical trials that are available for mesothelioma patients in the UK. And there are a select few that are available for, for peritoneal. Um, and, and from our MDT, we, we would put some recommendations or, or ask uh, referring teams to have a look at specific trials. So from over the telephone or over the computer or virtually, I offer any support that patients would need often um, patients haven't spoken to, to a nurse that perhaps has had any experience in looking after people with peritoneal mesothelioma. And I run a monthly virtual support group, which has been off the ground really since COVID started that sort of pushed us towards doing, doing it on this platform. Um, and it's really well attended. And I think we've all um, found it really beneficial to help support each other and listen to other stories um, and, and pass over any little tips that, uh, that they found along the way. And then for some patients that isn't, that isn't for them and, and that's fine, but they perhaps like to be able to still have some contact with somebody else who'd be going through something similar to them. So I offer a buddy, a buddy support system um, and, and I have a little list of people who would be interested and then I put, put two people in touch with each other and they talk on the telephone or, or via emails. Music UK hold uh, various events during the year, as you've heard from Liz at the beginning, and um, lots of virtual currently. Um, and uh, we, we will look to, to do those face to face in the near future. We did have a, a big event scheduled for peritoneal mesothelioma in 2020, which is uh, two years delayed. Uh, so it's scheduled for April next year when we'll all be able to get together um, for a day and have some lectures from all the specialists uh, around, around the UK. We're active on social media. So we've got our Facebook page, um, which patients are welcome to join. Um, I've got a Twitter account and uh, we're, we're all very easy accessible via those areas. And a lot of the time uh, talking to patients, it's finding out um, what, what perhaps what other extended services that they might need um, and looking at what is available in, in their area. 
And um, what I do try to do is if they haven't got a, a local nurse um, or if I can find particularly a, a, a nurse, a mesothelioma UK nurse in their region, um, then to put them in touch with each other. Um, and that can open up for them access to local services, um, aspects or support groups that are, that are up and running around the country as well. And uh, some patients might need support from Macmillan teams or the hospice teams. Um, so it's finding what services are available in their area and trying to access them for them. And that's the end for me. Thank you. Lovely, thank you both. Fahiz, is there anything you want to add at all? Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, just, it, it's been fantastic having Sam uh, help us and help us develop the, the, meso, the mesothelioma MDT. I think without Sam having the mesothelioma MDT on its own, probably would have, um, certainly wouldn't have been successful and it wouldn't have provided support for patients that she's provided, which has been tremendous. Um, so she's that she's that link, um, and and it and it makes the and she really is the advocate for the patients in the in the MDT because increasingly now I don't know what you think, but it's been getting it, it looks you know we, we we frequently because we're only doing these MDTs once a month we're frequently discussing 13, 14 patients who've had very complex pathways, but Sam's spoken to well pretty much all of them. And, and she can tell you exactly where they are and what they're, um, you know, what's, what's troubling them and um, how we can help them. Um, so yeah, it's been, and hopefully it's part of the evidence building that we can put uh, to people, uh, to, to NHS England to say, look, this, this service need, it's not a huge, um, it's, not, it, it's not a huge requirement for resource, but it, it would be good to have it recognized and I think it is recognised, and we know we've just gone on and done it. Um, but I think for a lot of patients, um, things could be smoother if if we had if we had that if it was established and it was accepted. Yeah, I, I agree with you totally. And I have to say, Sam, you know, we've said this to you repeatedly, but you've a huge asset to the Basingstoke team, to the Meso UK team, because the nurses have a direct link through to that specialist expert practice. But most importantly, to the patients, and that's what we're all here for. So, um, and you know, all of the Meso UK nurses, um, often they're uh, you know the Meso nurse within quite a large area, and we all know that it can be a bit of a lonely path sometimes. And you feel like you're, you know, sometimes you feel like you're a flea in people's ear, and um, it's not the most, um, you know, it can be a bit lonely. I think, kind of tracing a, a, a path for patients and um we on a national level that's even more so so i think we recognize that and um we're just delighted that it's worked out as well as what it has and um yeah and the thing is we're just like you i guess for he's and the whole team that the more we achieve the more we realize there's a lot more that we want to achieve you know it, you know how closer to the ultimate aim do we ever get um but on that note i mean there's a, we've got a few questions come in that i'm, I'm going to um, ask to you um uh, some comments as well about how supportive the virtual meetings are for patients in, in chat. Um, but on that note, I wanted to ask you, um, are there plans to go more frequent than monthly? Notice that, um, that there are no London-based centres, and that's a really dense area of the population, no London-based centres. And ultimately, when are you feeding back to NHS England about the MDT and you know what, what are the timelines for that so three questions in one really i guess <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> I, th I think joe if i start with the last question about the timelines i think covid has put a bit of a spanner in the works with that so for the last year uh we, we i mean we, there was a period of time where we had to stop operating completely for about five weeks but then we managed to get up and running again and now we're not doing as much as we were doing pre-covid but not far off um, so I guess, again, it's just picking the right time to go back to NHS England um, and, and to talk to them about, because we have an annual meeting with, with them for our, for our pseudomyxoma service. Um, and so, uh, you know, the commissioning would be along similar lines. 
and we did bring this up the last time we met pre-COVID. Um, so I think now that we've got a good body of evidence from the National Mesothelioma MDT, um, and also, I mean, you know, even though there are a lot of patients out there with peritoneal mesothelioma, at the moment, there's probably only a small proportion of those that would be suitable for the surgery that we're talking about. So, so it'd be, it's reassuring to any funding body that, you know, we're not going to be swamped or that we're not going to swamp them with all these people who are going to need very expensive treatments. Um, so that, yeah, so I'm hopeful that in the next 12 months, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to go back to them and say, um, uh, look, that, that we need to do something about this. Um, I can't remember your other questions now. What was, what was the other first two? You're muted. Yeah, you're so plans to go um plans to go fortnightly or oh, yeah and then and no london-based centers linking in on a regular basis and it's a big dense area of the country so it is i mean london and to those of you who live in london or worked in london know it's it's a bit of a black hole in this very strange magical things go on in london and and they there are little pockets of of, of people doing their own thing and not really wanting to let anything go, go out of London. So I, I mean, I think London is probably gonna be the next center for colorectal peritoneal metastasis, or there will be a center in London that will be commissioned. Again, that got put back because of COVID, but I, I would imagine in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll hear that there'll be another a, a center in London. And it would be, I would imagine that that would be then the natural choice if that centre is being badged as a peritoneal malignancy centre, that would be the natural choice. But, you know, even, man well, you know, our other centres have decided that they're, they're not going to treat surgically peritoneal mesothelioma because they, the trust can't take the financial risk of doing that when, when money doesn't come with it. Because for these other peritoneal malignancies, there is a, uh, you know, that there, there is a, there's a cushion that comes with funding, centralised funding that allows people allows trust to take this on without losing money because um, it's obviously resource intensive and if patients have complications they can be in hospital for a, a long time there can be an ITU for a number of uh, a, a number of days sometimes weeks um, and and unless there's a cushion there then people are staying away from this so I guess it's a you're, you're absolutely right there should be another center in in London and there should be other centers in the in the UK uh, to give people equitable access um, we'll hopefully get there. And the, to the bite, the, the, I mean, I don't know about, you probably have no better yeah. about me than the tw twice week. Yeah, twice well, I, I, well, I think certainly from the patient point of view, um, waiting a month for, for the MDT, especially if they've only just, if they've been referred at the point of we've just had a discussion, it's a long uh, time, time to wait. But I hope trying to sort of avoid um, their weight or anxiety or any treatments being delayed. I've had contact with them. I've spoken to their local teams, and 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 sometimes uh, we would just we'd have a quick quick look at the scans, and, and we'd say actually you know crack crack on with with some oncology treatments in the meantime, or, or instead of waiting. Um, but it, I think from my point of view, and I'd, I'd like it a little bit more frequently. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> well, we, we've recently introduced what um, what we call a CRAM meeting, which is a clinical radiological assessment meeting. So every week. We get about 20, 25 referrals for all disease types. So what we've done is we sit down with our radiologists and we just screen through those patients that we know we can't help. Um, and then we get back to their uh, referring teams quickly. Um, and then those people and some of those patients will have peritoneal mesothelioma. We can give a rapid. Um, so it's not a full MDT discussion, but it is. Yes, we can help you. No, we can't have some chemotherapy. And then we'll discuss you at the, the, the next National um, Peritoneal Mesothelium MDT. So I'm hopeful we'll, we, we'll reduce the delays or the time that it takes between each, between each meeting. Um, and that the big challenge for us, you know, is, is just that turnaround so that we're communicating with referring teams, we're, we're getting scans, we're, we're getting all that information and we're getting back to them in a timely fashion. And I know we don't always do that as quickly as we could. Well, like I say, having Sam there has helped tremendously. And, and just to be clear, it wasn't about having another surgical centre. It's just about having a London-based team that taps into your MDT. That seems... All right. Like that was what I was trying to... So we, okay, yeah. You know, the, the, 
what you deliver as a team is absolutely a fabulous service for the country. And so we just want more of that. It doesn't need to be in another centre. <laughs> doesn't need to be in another centre. So I'm going to go to some of the questions that have come through. Um, so Carol has asked, does the lack of funding um, that you've experienced, because you talked about this cushion, you've spoke about that in answering the question, does that mean that you can't treat everyone? So do you have to ration um, the number of procedures that you can do? No, no, we don't. We we don't do that. So we will. If there's someone that we think we can help, then we will 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 offer them a surgery. That the sad fact is, by the time we uh, we get to review these cases for for the majority, and that's probably you know eighty eighty percent of patients, they're just they're just not suitable, and they won't they won't ever be suitable for for the type of surgery that we do. But that that's not to say that. And, and those are, in a way, those are the type of patients that we need to get into trials, that we need to offer these other treatments, the new treatments like PIPAC, think about uh, immunotherapy. Um, and and that, that's why I'm very keen that we, um, you know, to put things into perspective, we're a district general hospital. It's slightly unusual what we do here. We're not like Leicester. We're not like the big teaching hospitals. So We've, we've been able to establish a, a national center for something very rare, but we're only, we're just building the blocks of an infrastructure for research um, to allow us, and we've got partners, and of course there are people around us who can help with that. But, um, you know, for me, certainly what I'd like to do is, is to establish a, you know, a big peritoneal mesothelioma, when I say big, a peritoneal mesothelioma trial, which is going to be um, uh, bold and allow us to, Get genetic characterization of these tumors and and have some and we've got we've got um got a couple of oncologists medical oncologists who are interested so it's really just putting something together that we can then go to funding on a broader scale to you know cancer research uk or the nihr um and and do that but yeah no to answer your question no we won't the lap the fund we've been very clear that we i mean with that we wouldn't we will treat the people that we think we can help yeah that's good to hear and i i am um... You know, I think what your ambition is exactly what we need. You know, that's what we need. We need a pragmatic peritoneal clinical trial for all comers uh, so that we can answer because, um, you know, I, I think that we've got the best infrastructure for clinical trials in this country. And as you like me, I don't think any other country could pull that kind of trial off. So I, I you know, it would be wonderful to see that happen. And I think, you know, ev anybody, um, and, and it's not that people are um, delayed in being referred to you. There may be an element of that. It, mesothelioma does present late, you know, so people yeah. miss the opportunity because their symptoms don't show themselves until late into the disease natural uh, development. But then after that, we do need to ensure that once people present with peritoneal uh, mesothelioma, that they are referred to you swiftly and quickly so that they can get that expert opinion. Um, and that's what we definitely try to achieve um, through the Mesa UK nurses. So another question Mavis has asked, our lovely Mavis. Hi, Mavis. Always lovely to have Mavis on board with us. She's asked, why are peritoneal patients so young? In comparison to, you said the median age was 50 something, I think, or? 57, um, yeah. yeah. So why are they so young in comparison to the, the, the across the board for Mesa? It's about 74 uh, um, is the median age. So what's your theory on that? Uh, it's a it's an interesting one. I mean, if you if you look at the parallels with other peritoneal cancers like pseudomyxoma, I was talking about before from appendix tumors, the median age is about the same. It's about 56, 57. So I I don't know why um, why patients are are so young, and and I, I guess it 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 raises that question about the etiology and whether where is this asbestos exposure. If you're talking about a 20 year lag period, then talking about people being exposed in their 30s, potentially, um, is it a different disease? I mean, I, I don't I don't know. I don't have a, a an answer to that. Um, and I'm just conscious of time. So Lorraine, our head of nursing, Lorraine, has um, also put in the chat, reminded me that um, the, the Mesothelium UK Research Centre at Sheffield um, have, is developing uh, in collaboration with Sam and your team uh, a, a patient um, experience or a comprehensive uh, probably case review or case with the personal meso. So watch this space for that. It's still in development, but we're very committed 
um, to support in the whole team on, on that level. But Lorraine has also asked, um, do you use the peritoneal index of disease when you're staging everybody? So yeah, we so we tend to yeah, it gives us an idea of um, disease extent. There's another. Our radiologists have also been doing a lot of work with mesothelioma, and they've they've come up with a scoring system it's called the Pause Score, where they incorporate the extensive disease with the peritoneal cancer index, but they also tell us about what we call unfavorable sites of disease. So even if you've got limited disease, if it's in the wrong places, as it were. And that's places that are difficult to deal with surgically. So around the blood supply to the liver or between the major blood vessels on the small bowel surfaces in the abdominal wall itself, then those are unfavorable sites. And so you may have very localized disease, but if we, it, what, what, bas what basically helps us make the decision is can we remove all of this or not? We know that if you've got a lot of disease, even if we can remove it, it's more likely to come back you're less likely to benefit but equally if you've got a small amount of disease if it's in areas that we can't remove then surgery is unlikely to benefit you okay. but but we use we use that peritoneal cancer index as an indicator so if patient if, if teams are referring to us and they can say look but but often we'll laparoscope these patients anyway and then we'll 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 calculate and have a look ourselves well, thank you both for sharing and giving us that really um, tremendous insight into the work. Carry on what you're doing. Um, peritoneal mesothelioma is a different place now compared to what it was. Um, you know, I just look back uh, even five years, but definitely 10 years when it was just, you know, it, we were desperate to get a specialist center off the ground in this way. So you, you, what you've achieved is amazing. And we know there's a lot more to do and we're going to be right there doing what we can to complement the service and support you. I think it's really important. It doesn't matter um, what stage your peritoneal media is at. We need to connect you with the specialist centre because there's the support that Sam has outlined that's really important, connecting people and creating that peritoneal community so that people and their families get the support that helps um, you know, carry them through the journey, irrespective of the treatment that they that they get. And then and we know that they're gonna then, if relevant, they're gonna get that specialist review. So um, so thank you. It's been an excellent afternoon. Um, I would just like to say to everybody who's joined us, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, an evaluation form will be coming to you by email. Um, please complete that. We'd be very grateful. And don't forget uh, muffins for Miso uh, in May. We'd be really glad to have your support um, in fundraising for the charity. Um, and with that, please go and enjoy a little bit of the sunshine that's left this afternoon. Thank you, Fahid. And thank you, Sam. Excellent presentation. Thanks very much, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye-bye.